Nine. They recognize you after your uniform. I'd say, you know what? I'd do a solid 85. Good morning, everyone. It's good numbers for the ship. How are you? Need a gavel. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and braving the weather, the snowstorm that isn't yet, um, which, is, which is great. Um, such a terrific crowd here at the Terrafil Room to talk about a very uh, important issue, uh, aging in America. Um, they call it the senior tsunami or senior boom. And I was reading statistics this morning that by uh, 2020, the number of older people will outnumber the number of children uh, under five years old. In the next 25 years, the number of people over 65 will double. Um, I see this as the new frontier, a really exciting time to rise to the occasion as public policy officials and local representatives and agencies and all of us to rise to the occasion to make sure that our greatest generation has what they need um, to grow old with grace and dignity and all the opportunities um, that they deserve. And we're going to be talking today about health care and, and transportation and housing and all of the things that are on your mind and being able to stay in your homes and uh, affordability of food and, and uh, prescription drugs and you name it. Um, we're going to have a lively discussion with a terrific forum um, and lots of opportunities for questions and answers and help us get ready for the 2020 session, which starts on February 5th, and as Vice Chair of the Aging Committee, um, uh, such legislation will start in my committee, which is terrific. So I'm proud to be Vice Chair of the Aging Committee representing you uh, at the State Capitol. I'm delighted to have as my co-host today uh, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Connecticut, Susan Bysowitz, who I've known a long time as a former staffer at the Capitol. And uh, she's a former legislator herself, former Secretary of the State, um, and a terrific Lieutenant Governor who's already hit the ground running on many issues. Um, and when I asked her to come and, and co-host this event, she jumped at the opportunity because this is one of her priorities and the administration's. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Lieutenant Governor, the Honorable Susan Bysowitz. Thank you so much, John. It is such a pleasure for Governor Lamont and I to work with Representative Hampton. He truly is one of our strong partners, and I'm so delighted to be here on behalf of myself and Governor Lamont to talk about some very important issues, um, making sure that uh, our uh, seniors are taken care of is is absolutely one of our top priorities and I think we're going to be joined by our Department of uh, Aging Commissioner shortly uh, but before we hear from any of our panelists I want to talk to you about an issue that's critical to every one of us uh, and that is the upcoming 2020 census and here's why it's important our state will get almost $11 billion per year based on the number of people that we have in our state. And I'll tell you, it is a massive effort to count 3.5 million people. And we want to maximize the federal funding that is based on the numbers of people we have in our state. And so you're, you're wondering, well, what would that be? Well, it's Medicaid, it's Head Start, it's uh, energy uh, assistance for seniors, it's community development block grants. There are more than 55 federal programs that receive money based on how many people we have in our state. So you will be receiving sometime in the two weeks between mid-March and the beginning of April notice in the mail that the census forms are coming. But this is uh, something new. This census and other ones you've completed um, 
And what's new is, for the first time in the history of our census, you can fill it out online. So um, when you get that postcard in the mail, it'll tell you where you go if you would like to fill the census out online. And if you don't fill it out online, then you will receive a paper form in the mail. And if you don't fill out the paper form uh, by the end of April, then someone is likely to come knock on your door, one of those enumerators. So uh, I would encourage you uh, to fill it out online, fill it out on paper, or call the 800 number, which will be on the postcard as well. If that's easier, you can just pick up the phone and fill it out over the phone with one of our census takers. That's also um, something new this year that hasn't been available before. And it's important to note that for each person that is not counted, our state loses $2,900 for all of those federal programs, uh, SNAP, WIC, Medicare, all of that. So that's why we really want to stress the importance of everyone filling out the census forms. And here's another uh, very interesting piece of news, and I hope that um, some of you will consider doing this. The Census Bureau wants to uh, hire 28,000 people in Connecticut to be enumerators. Those are part-time positions, and they pay between $21 and $25 an hour, which is excellent for part-time work. So if any of you would like to uh, have one of those positions, you should go to the 2020census.gov slash jobs to apply. And for this area, it's $21. For Fairfield County and New Haven County, it's $25 an hour. But the Census Bureau is looking for people in every community who can help. So I hope that uh, some of you who would be interested in part-time work uh, would go ahead and apply because we need 28,000 people to apply just for employment opportunities uh, in Connecticut. So um, I wanted to put that on your radar. I also wanted uh, to mention uh, our state unit on aging, which is within the Department of Aging and uh, Disability Services. And that State Department uh, oversees a number of programs, including home delivered meals or Meals on Wheels, congregate meals, caregiver support, health and wellness, senior employment, health insurance counseling, Alzheimer's respite care, and elder abuse prevention. Um, and the state unit on aging is working on its new three-year state plan on aging uh, because, as Representative Hampton has said, uh, we are coming up on a silver tsunami. And so we want um, our state to be prepared. So the other thing I wanted to uh, mention that is on the agenda and it's an important topic that's going to be discussed uh, is the cost of prescription drugs. Um, the state unit on aging has a program called Choices. Um, and Choices helps our older adults and people with disabilities who have Medicare understand uh, what their options are under Medicare. And this is important because right now, um, the annual Medicare open enrollment is going on. So that takes place um, right up until December 7th. So um, I'm glad that you're going to be hearing from some experts uh, on that. And finally, uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, say thank you because we have been celebrating uh, Veterans uh, Day 
uh, this weekend, and I know we have many veterans here, and in fact, we have a special person um, that is going to uh, be recognized at our Veterans Hall of Fame ceremony that happens once a year, and uh, the state of Connecticut chooses a very few number of distinguished veterans, and um, I hope I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, but Representative Hampton, why don't you explain a little more about that? Yes, I received a call on Friday afternoon um, that one of Simsbury's own, um, my beloved uh, principal of my elementary school, um, Len Lanza, who's sitting here in front, will be inducted into the Veterans Hall of Fame in December of this year. Yeah. He's an incredible man, an incredible veteran, great educator. Um, he still scares the heck out of me. My former principal. I feel like I should stand up. Um, and I never had to visit his office, which was good, right? It, uh, um, but congratulations, it's well deserved. Does uh, just a break? Does everyone have a chair? Do we need to? Some chairs over here. There's some chairs There's over here. Um, maybe one of our vendors will. Are there extra chairs over there? No. Um, Excellent. Are you all set? Yeah. All right. Well, I think we'll turn it over to our um, amazing panelists. I'm so grateful that they've all joined us today. And I think we'll start down um, to the right on the end. Uh, yes. OK. So thank you so much, Representative Hampton and um, Lieutenant Governor, Governor Bice, for letting me um, be a part of this today. So I just to, I live in town here um, in Simsbury and grew up in Bloomfield. So um, obviously I have a vested interest in um, really moving the town forward and doing what's best for the citizens of, of Simsbury. So I currently, I have been a state employee for the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services for 31 years. Um, I've done many different things, community mental health, I did forensic mental health, um, and four years ago moved over to finally use my minor from college in gerontology um, to become the director of long-term services and supports, which encompasses older adult services um, for um, Demas. So our programs for older adults, um, we two years ago revamped our senior outreach and engagement program. So we cover the entire state. The senior outreach and engagement program is for um, seniors who are at risk, and it could be for mental health, for substance use disorders, who are not connected to services. And we have case managers that um, can go anywhere in the state to into wherever we need to, whether it's hospitals, the um, people's homes. Um, and what they do is they really do that incredible outreach and engagement and try to refer people to the proper services. So our hope is that with those services and engaging, they'll be able to age in place. And that is really our goal with Demas is to be able to help seniors age in place in the least restrictive environment. Um, along with that, we oversee several waiver programs. Um, again, with the with the Olmstead Act, that was really um, about least restrictive environment for people um, and allowing people to remain integrated into the community. So we have several programs um, to assist. Um, seniors with that as well. We also have a diversion nurse program, and I have um, some pamphlets um, on the back table over there, but this is all on our DEMIS website. Um, we have six nurses and two case managers across the state that can, again, go into nursing homes, to hospitals, to people's homes, um, again, to, to do evaluations to see what's necessary, whether it's medical, mental health, substance use, um, and really begin to wrap services around so that people, again, can remain integrated into the community. Um, so our goal, again, is to really partner with the governor's office on the rebalancing efforts for the state, um, where we're hoping to move people out of nursing homes that don't need to be in nursing homes and don't want to be in nursing homes, um, and to really be able to give them the community services um, that they need. So thank you. Thank you. Aaron Levitt-Smith. 
I don't think I said that, did I? <laughs> That's important. Aaron Levitt Smith, L E A V I T T. And could we get a chair for our commissioner? I, um, I'm the director of long term services and supports. De Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Am I up next? Are we going in order? Okay. <laughs> thank you, John, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Sorry. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Bysowitz, for inviting me to this important conversation. I am Deb Bibbins. I am the founder of For All Ages. It is a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to connect the generations, to improve health and well being and to change the dialogue on aging. And I'm joined here today uh, with Gary Sikorsky, who is in that back corner. He is my co-founder. And together, we are on a mission to have a real impact in Connecticut. Our work is focused on creating connections between older adults and younger generations. And we're doing this for two reasons. The first is to combat loneliness and isolation. And when we look at isolation, and loneliness, they've been identified as key social determinants um, of health, which means they impact the health and well-being of all ages of society. And we know that we're social animals. Social interaction is critical to our well-being. And research indicates that social isolation is actually having negative health impacts equal to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Wow. Which is an interesting st statistic. And Cigna last year came out with a study focused on loneliness. And that study indicated that 50% of Americans are reporting being lonely. And when we think about that, in Connecticut alone, that means 1.8 million of us are lonely. A separate report has come out very recently indicating a connection between loneliness and dementia. And it has been reported that individuals that are lonely have a 40% higher risk of developing dementia than those that are socially connected. Again, an astounding statistic. It's difficult to put a dollar amount on loneliness, right? And yet, Medicare has actually done this. They have reported that they spend, on average, an additional $134 a month for every lonely adult versus every socially connected adult. When we look at this across the United States, that comes out to $6.7 billion a year. And so when we take a step back and think about intergenerational connection, we are thinking about it not only from the perspective of improving individuals' health and well-being, we're thinking that it has the potential to reduce Medicare spending in the United States. The second goal of connecting generations is really to change the dialogue around aging and to have people view aging in a very positive light, which it isn't always done today. Studies have identified that negative thoughts about our own aging actually set us up for cognitive disorders as we age. And separate research indicates that people that have a positive view about aging live on average seven and a half years longer. So our work is intentionally focusing on programs where older adults are mentoring youth and where older adults and youth are coming together on an equal footing and doing work together. The whole idea is to provide older adults with a purpose and to shine a light on the vitality of older adults and to show youth that older adults have a lifetime of valuable wisdom and experience to share. And in this way, we believe that people will recognize older adults as contributors to our society, not as a burden to society. 
And in so doing, we're hoping that community cohesion across each of our communities will increase. For All Ages has chosen to begin our work here in Simsbury. Simsbury is one of four towns in the state that has signed up to strive to become age friendly. And one of our programs here in, in the town involves older adults mentoring youth in a very intentionally non-traditional subjects. Woodworking and carpentry and painting. Not things that you typically think of in a, in a mentoring setting. Our second program will unite 350 older adults and youth in town to connect to have fun and to perform very simple community service work. We're getting folks together to paint 350 stones that will be laid out next May 22nd for our Simsbury Rocks intergenerational all access townwide scavenger hunt in celebration of Simsbury's 350th anniversary. And we're already working on our next set of programs that will broaden our reach to the greater Hartford area. So in closing, I'd like to say that we're, we're thinking about later life today in a very positive light. So it's not a time necessarily as was perceived many years ago to retire and to disengage. We're really thinking about it as a time when people are seeking engagement, they're seeking enjoyment, and they're seeking connection. And they're seeking to give back to their communities. And therefore it's critical in my view, that older adults are given the opportunity to connect, to be connected socially and to be connected within their community and not isolated and not separated from it as historically has been the case. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. We're gonna um, backtrack a little to the commissioner and let her introduce herself. Thank you, commissioner, for being here. Good morning, everyone. My name's Amy Porter. I'm the Commissioner for the Department of Aging and Disability Services. You heard the Lieutenant Governor talking a little bit about our state agency. We provide both aging and disability services, and, and you heard some of the list. I'm not on the panel today. I really just came to be supportive. I heard all of you were going to be here. I wanted to hear what you had to say. I wanted to listen to your reactions to the topics that were on the agenda. They're all things that are critically important for us as we're thinking about our new state plan, as we're thinking about developing services that are responsive to your needs. So I'm just here to listen and I'm really excited to hear what the rest of the panel has to say and what all of you have to say. So thank you for inviting me today. Thank you. Amy Porter, Commissioner for the Department of Aging and Disability Services. Hello, I'm Carolyn Kristiniak. I have a really wonderful job here with the town of Simsbury. I work in the Department of Social Services and Community Services with a wonderful director. And we have a lot of programs, but the program that I am focused in on is the senior outreach. I'm the one that gets the pleasure every day to talk to seniors, to listen to seniors, and try to figure out if there's something we can possibly do to help you. There are different programs. We make connections if we find that there's a resource that might be available to you. We are very accessible. You do not need an appointment to come in. We will answer the phone if you call us. We will return messages. I am also a choices counselor. And thank you again for Lieutenant Governor Susan Bysowitz and John, uh, State Representative John Hampton. They're wonderful people. We all care about seniors, and we all want to know what's going on, and we all want to try to help you. Thank you. It's the ever-traveling microphone. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here this morning, and thank you to um, John Hampton for inviting me today to attend, and um, thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for being here. Um, I am Kristen Formanak. I'm the Director of Community and Social Services for the Town of Simsbury. And um, like Carolyn shared, we have uh, many programs and services available to assist our seniors in town. We are um, open and welcoming to um, anybody that lives in town to walk through our doors and seek assistance. Um, we provide a, a ride 
wide range of services, like I already said, that's not just for our seniors in town. We provide services for all the way from birth to death, um, and many of our services are have already been mentioned, but the things that we do are um, things like taking our energy assistance applications. So if you need help with your energy bill, we, we provide that service. Um, we also are the intake site for renter's rebate. A lot of our seniors take care, take, um, take advantage of our renter's rebate program to help um, give them a refund at the end of every year. We also work directly with our senior center. Um, I hope that many of you have visited our senior center here in town. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do so. Um, we brought a lot of brochures with us. We also brought our senior communicator newsletters. Those are on the back table. Um, it's full of all of the opportunities that we have for you in the senior center. Um, there's exercise classes every day that you could take advantage of. We often have speakers and special presentations. We offer trips outside of town. And we also have um, lunch two days a week on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, and all of those things, to, to go back to um, what has already been said, is to help combat that, that loneliness and that depression that sometimes we see in our seniors. Because we want you to be involved. We don't want you to be home alone. Um, but we do offer outreach services to seniors that may be homebound. Um, that does happen, especially when we see our seniors that are trying to stay in that least restrictive environment. We know that you might need services, and we can help to coordinate that, whether it be home care or um, a visitor or if you need some food delivered. Um, so basically, I guess what I'm saying is as a social worker and as um, oversight of the social services department, Pretty much people call us for just about everything. And if we don't have the answer, we will help you to find the place that does. So um, thank you for having us here today. And we're looking forward to hearing your questions later. Yeah. Morning. My name is Ed Lemontine. I am the chairman of the Simsbury Aging and Disability Commission. I'm also the executive director of the Simsbury Housing Authority. However, today I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Aging and Disability Commission what we do, services we provide, and then uh, I want to talk about two special initiatives that we have going on. So right now, the purpose of the commission is to study and evaluate the needs, the services, and events which are designed to enhance the quality of life of older adults. We also advise the Simsbury Social Services Department or the selectmen on policy issues regarding older adults and we recommend appropriate services. We're currently working on two initiatives of interest to older adults. The first is called Age-Friendly Community. Earlier this year, we became one of only four towns in Connecticut to enroll in the AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities. So due to the rapid aging population in our community, this program will advance efforts to help people live easily and comfortably in their homes and community as they age. So over the next three to five years, the Commission will be assessing eight domains that influence the health and quality of older adults. And these include outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation, housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communi communication and information, and community support and health services. So our goal is to develop a three-year community-wide action plan based on our assessment findings and input from older adults in the community. And I do want to say up to this point, we have signed, a, signed on eight community partners, one of whom is for uh, all ages. So our second initiative is the development of a medical equipment loan locker. So on December 1st, we will open our loan locker at the Apple Barn on Old Farms Road in West Simsbury. The loan locker will be a local source for durable medical equipment to meet a growing need for those in the community who are experiencing a temporary or permanent disability. This equipment is going to be free of charge to those in need and will include such items as wheelchairs, walkers, reachers, commodes transport chairs, shower chairs, canes, and other items. So we do have a dedicated phone line for people to call to request or donate equipment, and we are going to be doing all pickups and drop-offs by appointment because we are utilizing a large group of volunteers that are going to be assisting us in this venture. 
There should be a press release uh, coming out this week, and we are developing a flyer which will be located at various locations around the community. So our commission, which is probably the largest commission in the town of Simsbury, uh, we have 16 members and three liaison individuals. We meet the third Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock at Eno Memorial Hall. We welcome anyone who has an interest in programs and services to feel free to, uh, to attend these meetings. So I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Good morning, and thank you, John, for inviting me. I'm Betty Marafino, president of the Connecticut Alliance for Retired Americans. And we have about 50,000 members in the state. Uh, yeah. Retired, some of you may be members, uh, retired state employees. If you're a member, retired AFT or CEA member, several unions uh, and community groups. And we're affiliated nationally with the AFL-CIO, which has currently 36 states have Alliance for Retired Americans. So we are working on national issues of importance to seniors, and we also work on those issues in our state legislature that are important to to seniors. And I, I'm so happy that John Hampton is vice chair of aging, which is good because there are so many issues in our state that that need uh, need attention from the general public. And so I, I just want to talk a little bit about some of our national issues that we're working on. And those are to preserve and protect Social Security and also to preserve and strengthen Medicare and Medicaid. This past uh, March, I was honored to be invited by Congressman John Larson to testify in Congress. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Congressman Larson is chair of the Social Security Subcommittee of the Ways and Means Committee. And he does have his Social Security Bill 2100. And I have materials for that over on that side table by the window if you want to take a look at it. There are also some other Social Security bills in Congress. But when I was in Congress and talking to the, the committee, uh, both Democrats and Republicans seemed to think that it was important to strengthen Social Security. And the three-legged stool metaphor came up because most people, when you retire, you have your savings, your Social Security, and your pension. And we know that so many, especially of the younger people coming along, will not retire with a pension. And if Social Security is threatened in any way, we do not want a nation of paupers. And so when I went to testify in Congress, uh, I used some stories that we had gathered last year from our members, and we went out into the community and talked to people who were saying, I'm so afraid. What if I lose so Social Security? And also, how will I be able to pay for my medical bills and my med uh, prescription drugs? And so we, we use that. And I use the, the example of my own grandmother, who lived in Southington and lived to 102, but she was a widow at age 50 with six children, including my mother. And my grandfather had worked in a factory, and he died suddenly of a heart attack. And she kept saying, oh, I don't want to have to go to the poorhouse. And there were poorhouses all over Connecticut. And there was one in Southington. And I remember that she would make bread and take it to the poorhouse. And a few times I went with her to the poorhouse. And they were not places that you would want to live. There was a little cot, you know, and some basic meals a day. and. That was about it. Fortunately, you know, she, she kept saying, thank goodness I have grandpa's social security, which was not a lot, but it was able to keep her in her very modest home. When I say modest home, until I was 13, there was an outhouse. So that's how modest the ho her home was. But she never had to go into the poorhouse. So we don't want generations coming along to have to worry about that if Social Security is diminished and if their health care and Medicare is diminished. So we're also working on pre preserving, strengthening Medicare. 
and on the state level, I'm so happy to hear the folks down the other end of the table talking about aging in place because that is, is so important. And uh, I'm also glad that I met Deb there on the uh, For All Ages because our organization is, has just started an intergenerational alliance. We're just putting it together and we started it because those of us in the alliance say our kids and our grandkids say, oh, Social Security is not going to be there for me when I retire. And we want to talk to them about the importance of getting engaged. And we also want to hear from the young people what's important to you and how can we work together. So we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, John, for having me here today. Uh, my name is Paul Gerbowski, and I'm an attorney at the Center for Medicare Advocacy. We are located in Mansfield, Connecticut, um, and I really think we're an under, uh, underutilized resource for you, for folks on Medicare. Um, we are a nonprofit law firm, and we will represent Connecticut Medicare beneficiaries free of charge in Medicare appeals. So if you come up to a situation where you're being denied, whether it's for a hospital stay, a skilled nursing facility stay, or a piece of durable medical equipment, lab, an x-ray, really anything that Medicare could deny, uh, you should give our office a call. Uh, again, we are free of charge. Uh, we can talk you through what your coverage rights are, what Medicare does and doesn't cover. We're staffed with attorneys, paralegals, nurses, um, and we can really provide the full spectrum of legal advice and, uh, and representation. Um, our Office also does a lot of outreach throughout Connecticut. We work with the local area agencies on aging to educate about Medicare, um, educate about what is covered, how the appeals process works, um, and also right now it's open enrollment. We do a lot of outreach around open enrollment uh, to make sure people are assessing their options right now. It's really important if you are on a Medicare Advantage plan that you're checking your evidence of coverage and your annual notice of change right now to see if anything has changed as you prepare for the next year. Um, it's not uncommon that the networks will change right now or um, that your pricing may change. So it's really, really important you evaluate your options uh, up, up until December 7th right now. Um, so I have a, a table of resources in the back that folks should feel free to grab. My cards are there. Um, and our website, medicareadvocacy.org, has a lot of great self-help materials. Um, so we have um, appeals packets that'll help you through multiple uh, types of denial situations. I, I really recommend you utilize those um, and, and feel free to give us a call. We are a resource for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hosting this amazing forum, and thanks for everyone for being here. For those of you who can't see me, hi. <laughs> um, my name's Nora Duncan. I am the state director for AARP Connecticut, and I kind of just want to say ditto, because everything everybody mentioned is part of our scope of work. Um, and, and it's exciting to be able to be here in Simsbury, because you are a member of the network of age-friendly communities, and those eight domains that were discussed um, are really part of our core mission. For those of you who don't know, uh, AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan social mission organization with a membership of nearly 600,000 here in Connecticut and 38 million nationwide. So do I have some members in the room? Awesome. You may be hearing from me. If, I, if you hear my voice next Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. calling to talk about the census, pick up. Because I've got to go. <laughs> you're welcome. Or if on Monday you're watching CPTV at 8 p.m., we're doing a fraud presentation on Connecticut Public Television. We're sponsoring a show on how to help prevent frauds and scams. Um, working on age discrimination and job seekers and the same thing, protecting and um, Medicare and Social Security. And uh, the thing, though, today that I have been asked to talk about um, is the high cost of prescription drugs. So generally speaking, that is a topic that a lot, I get a lot of nodding on. So how many people here have struggled to pay for their prescription drugs or know someone who has? We've got about 21% of Connecticut residents stopped taking their medication in 2017 because they could not afford it. Um, and there's a lot behind that. And it's not research and development. 
And it's not, you know, what everybody, that's important stuff. But the increases in prescription drugs are at a point right now that they are at the, the, the breaker of the back of the American healthcare system. And so we have been working uh, on a campaign that we call Stop Our Eggs Greed. So we're not, <laughs> we're not really mincing words about what we think the problem is. And that is a, a state by state campaign, but it's also a federal campaign. So I've had the privilege of um, being on several panels recently about a federal bill called HR3, which is um, going through Congress right now at actually lightning pace with a look to probably have a vote on the floor of the House soon. And then we always have the problem of the Senate. But we are hoping that bill, which actually does really good stuff, is going to pass. Um, so if you hear from AARP or you want to sign my petition that I'll send to your member of Congress, who happens to be very supportive of it, so I've been on his panels, um, assuming most of you are from here, uh, that's really, um, it's important for you to help us speak to Congress. And it's important, you know, I sit and people say, what can I do here in Connecticut if our delegation's all supportive? I say two things. One, you know, it's Thanksgiving. Instead, of, we can talk politics, but let's talk about something we all agree on, especially if you're with family from out of state who may have a member of Congress who isn't as supportive. It's sort of a spread the word or it's use your social media for good. <laughs> Get the information out there uh, to maybe your family members in places that um, need a little push. But here in, in Connecticut, we've got, we've got our own battles to fight. And we weren't successful in 2019 in the legislative session in fighting for that. Um, and we plan to come back in 2020 to try to get some really good work done on prescription drugs. My focus for prescription drugs in 2020 in Connecticut is about Canadian reimportation, And it is about pay for delay. Does anybody know what pay for delay is? Basically, um, so if you just basically get paid to do nothing if you're a manufacturer of a generic drug. That's the simplest way I can put it. It's the effort where we keep generics off the market by paying generic manufacturers to not make the generic. So it's patent related, it is, uh, the FTC hates it, and it is a very common practice that will keep the name brand on the market for longer. And so we've got some, several ways to try to help um, get that under control. But I want to give you a couple of stats just to round up what the problem really is. So um, the top three medications for the Connecticut residents diagnosed with cancer, diabetes or prediabetes or heart disease have all increased almost by double in between 2012 and 2017. Those are not new drugs. I've got the stats in the back. These are just price increases above and beyond inflation. And what that looks like to Medicare, for instance, just to Medicare alone, um, the, in October of 2019, um, the AARP Public Policy Institute released some studies that one of them that I think really strikes a chord for me is that um, Medicare beneficiaries and taxpayers paid $110 billion over recent years above and beyond normal inflationary price increases for prescription meds. And so we've got some, some state government officials here. What does that mean for Connecticut? Well, it's five times Connecticut's annual budget. So five times Connecticut's annual budget. That's just on prices above inflation. That would cover rent for 9 million Americans. It would buy groceries for 25 million American families for a year. This is just the above and beyond. So when we think about what's important and how we get things under control so we can keep our money in our own pockets, we can live and age in place, we've got to tackle some of the, the biggest problems in the American healthcare system. So I look forward to 2020 work on this. Thank you so much. Um, so we've talked a lot, but we really are most concerned about hearing from you and your questions and concerns. Um, so we thought we'd pass the mic. Um, Jason, pass the mic. We're going to do Oprah style here and uh, pass it around. Card. So don't be shy. Uh, anybody having any particular questions? Yes. And while the mic is going to this lady over here in the green sweater, um, can we have a round of applause for our panelists? What an impressive group of people. Hi, I'm Sharon Byron and local resident since forever. Uh, so I'm interested in the drug P 
piece. I've just returned from a Harvard study on Global Institute. Number one, we have a lot of waste in our drug. We did a huge collection of all our drugs. Those could be recycled. And then number two is that who are you going to sue if you have a problem with, the, with a uh, generic drug? Who you can sue? Exactly. Well, I, I'm not an attorney, so that lawsuits aren't my aren't my forte. Well, yeah, but it would exactly. Yeah. And so personally, you know, I have a script that I get from Canadian Pharmacy, a lot cheaper than I would get through my healthcare. So yeah. I just like you to be aware of that. Yes, yeah. and you know, so and it's I mean it's a, it's it's synthroid for thyroid. It's not a big deal, but it, it's something that I was really surprised. We're subsidizing the Canadian healthcare system. What, what it system. cost me to get a month at yeah. CVS versus mail order to my house and not spending any other money. Thank you. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is the kind of examples we hear it's all the time. It's more the recycling though, because drugs right now, if you have, yeah. sometimes people have to change or whatever, and those drugs could go into the Red Cross for some of these emergency situations when people are displaced. Thank you. Well, I just wanna, the recycling is, a slightly different topic, but one that I've heard raised in several forums. So you're not alone. Um, and the issue of, of, just so everyone knows, states uh, like Colorado, Vermont have passed um, the Canadian drug importation, Florida, these are red and purple states, and the president has actually moved his administration in that direction. So I'm pretty sure we can get Connecticut there too. And I would just say also that the Attorney General has sued the makers of generic drugs on price inflation, so he's leading that charge for us as well. I'm Diana Woodbury. I have a local question. After six commissions to build a senior center, we still don't have one. We do need one. There's not enough parking. Could you tell me what is being done about it? Um. So I can tell you, and then Kristen can add to it. Um, at the t that was a, a town issue that uh, they had asked me to secure bonding for a senior center for a design study. There was a design study done. Um, and sadly, at this juncture, there has been no movement on the development of a new senior center. A lot of people think that Eno is outdated and not very accessible. And um, are, you, are you one of those that share that, that, those concerns? And there's a big debate on whether to renovate Eno, whether to have a self-standing um, senior center in, I believe, Stratton Forest, com combining seniors and teen center. Um, but it's a long, ongoing conversation. Um, and Kristen, I don't know if you have any updates on a new senior center. Um, hi. Um, unfortunately, no, I don't have any updates on that. Um, it would be somewhere in the long-term planning because, as you know, everything comes down to budget and money. Um, I do know that in the meantime, we have been making some improvements to Eno, as um, Representative Hampton said. Um, last year, we renovated our kitchen and our lower level restrooms. Um, we were able to repave one of our walkways. Um, most recently, we've installed a generator so that we'll have an additional building that's available to be run on generator services in the event of an emergency. Um, and I believe, but not to, um, answer for other departments that there are some plans in the works to improve the entryway um, that is handicapped accessible. So in, in light of um, not having an answer or knowing when we would have a new senior center, um, because unfortunately those are up to people that are not me, um, <laughs> but I do know that we've, you know, been trying to put in a lot of effort into making, you know, better and more accessible in the meantime. Um, and I do know that a lot of people share your concerns in particular regarding the parking. So my, uh, the Aging Disability Commission was one of those six commissions uh, that you're referring to. So I've been a commissioner uh, for 25 years, and probably half of those years we've been talking about a senior center. Um, I have a stack of files of plans and, and discussions and public hearings and things that I've attended and my commissioners have attended. 
but as Chris had mentioned, we get to a certain point and then it stops. <coughs> However, having said that, um, if I'm on the commission for another 25 years, you could be assured that we will be <laughs> looking at that issue going forward and working with Chris and other town departments to at least make some improvements in the senior center. Uh, Diana Moody, um, has there ever been any concern about over-medication, uh, working with doctors, um, and if so or not, um, do, how does that fit into your equation with the cost of drugs? I think Demas. There's a lot Demas has to say about that. That is a concern. Um, we've... We're trying to get the word out in long-term services and supports around um, that issue and really helping seniors advocate. And, and what we're finding is that many doctors um, are not, um, they don't have a geriatric background. So that's one, there are not a lot of geriatric doctors. Um, and certainly from a mental health point of view, there's even fewer geriatric psychiatrists. So that's an issue. And what we find is that doctors, if you, if you have a psychiatrist and a, and a general doctor, that those doctors really need to be talking um, because medications can um, interfere with other medications and cause side effects. And then what's what's the answer? People go, oh, another pill. And the next thing you know, you're on a dozen pills. Um, statistics are in, um, in UConn Center on Aging, and also they have a really great geriatric program at UConn. Um, but the more medications you're on, and the sooner you go on medications, the, the um, poorer the health outcomes are for seniors. So what I advocate for is it should not necessarily be the first line is to give somebody a pill, and that's what we do in this day and age. And I don't know if people saw, there was a, a recent article in The Current around studies around giving people antidepressants or giving people talk th therapy first, and what were the long-term outcomes of that. And what they found was that talk therapy was just as effective at a five-year juncture as it was giving somebody an antidepressant. But in this day and age, the fastest and least expensive thing to do is to give people a pill. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that, and I, I'm in the mental health field. I, I'm a therapist by trade, so I believe in talk therapy. But it's not, it, in this day and age where people are in and out of the hospital, in and out, that's unfortunately the first thing we go to. So we are doing education around that. Um, we at Demas put on a, um, an older adult conference this year. We're doing one next year. And that was one of the topics that we talked about is medications. We're doing it again because people want the information about proper medication, what people should do to advocate, um, and, and really trying to integrate behavioral health and physical health and that those people really need to be talking um, because it can really have adverse effects. So I think we've made baby steps, but more needs to, more needs to be done. And, and we need to have more people interested in providing good geriatric care. And I just want to add to that question about over prescribing of prescription drugs. Um, one of the issues that Governor Lamont and I are focusing on is battling the opioid crisis because we've been losing a thousand people a year from the very young to our oldest adults. And to hear a state representative um, from West Hartford, Tammy Exum, talk about her two teenage sons who got their wisdom teeth removed and both had opioids prescribed for them just, you know, because they might have pain after getting their teeth extracted, um, shows us that we have a lot of work to do. And the legislature has made some steps in um, having doctors reduce the amount of time they can prescribe opioids, but um, we have only begun to scratch the surface of the issue that you raised, and it's something that goes across the age groups. Hi. Um, Sue Sames, I'm a Simsbury resident for about 20 years or so, and I was really interested in the age-friendly community um, concept, and you know, if you could 
you know, you, either the woman from AARP or the commissioner could talk a little bit about what our specific plans are and also interested in who the eight partners are as well as kind of how people can get involved in that. I also go to the uh, United Methodist Church in town, so I was curious how you're you kind of pulling in other, other parts of the community. I knew somebody was going to ask me to do it in eight partners. And I didn't write them down, but I'm going to try. So McLean, the Chamber of Commerce, Main Street Partnership for All Ages, the Simsbury Granby Rotary Club. And I do have a letter going to the Simsbury Methodist Church uh, requesting that they be a partner. Um, also, oh, it's, it's, you know, I'm one of those older adults, so you have to, you know. Um, see, I should write things down, but, and, but I, there's, a, there's a couple more that we have contacted. So our, so our plan, this is a long-term plan. So those eight domains are something that my commission is going to look at, and we have some really dedicated people on that commission that are going to take each one of those domains, look at them individually. We have a survey that's about six pages that's going to be going out to the general community to get input from not only uh, older adults, but from others in the community so that we can garner the information that we need to make an assessment. Based upon all the information that we receive, we will then come up with an action plan that's going to address each of those eight domains. And then those recommendations will go to the Board of Selectmen and hopefully at some point uh, they will, we will be taking some action in order to address those. Okay. Uh, good morning. I moved to Simsbury in, uh, in March, and I'm at McLean, and I'm, I, I'm glad to hear that McLean is a partner um, in, in all of this. Um, the, something that popped into my head when you were discussing over medication. Uh, two things come to mind, and that is, one is that you can't, I prefer to go to um, not be in the medical model right now. I prefer to be outside of the medical model with, um, with chiropractors and naturopaths and doctors who are involved with functional medicine, who I think take a more uh, fundamental approach to illness. And so we're not taking a lot of medication. My husband and I take thyroid, and that's it. What was interesting was when we came to Connecticut, and we found this where we lived before in North Carolina, and that is that when you go to a medical doctor, they have their three or four drugs. If you go to a cardiologist, you're going to be put on a statin, a beta blocker, maybe something for high blood pressure, and then you're going to have the drug interactions that occur with those. But that's... That's their, that's their toolbox, and they don't really want to look at other approaches. And I think part of that is the way that Medicare has kind of been set up so that they pay for this type of, of medical services. I don't get paid very much when I go to the chiropractor, and if, I, and if I go for other reasons than a back issue, I'm paying out of pocket, and I'm paying a lot of money out of pocket, or if I go to a naturopath. And I would like to see maybe some push to get these types of providers, which seem to be um, practicing in a way that would help with some of these high costs of drugs, to be covered by, um, you know, to be covered so that I'm not paying hundreds and hundreds and more than that out of pocket for these kinds of medical services. Now, I'm in a very fortunate position where I can afford that, but there are so many people who can't, but if they could go to doctors that, or practitioners that are not po constantly prescribing pills, that might be able to put a dent in it. So it's kind of a twofold thing. Thank and you. I'll just say that there is an effort at the state level to push for more of that naturopathic coverage, which I prefer myself. Um, and I can't speak to what's happening at the federal level, but I know that I've had um, organizations representing naturopathic physicians come to my office and say, you know, this is the legislation that we're putting forward because we are behind some states like Vermont that allow naturopaths to do more. And it's in the area of prevention and health and wellness, which, you know, everybody prefers. 
So I, I haven't heard of anything on the federal level, um, but it reminds me that Medicare is constantly changing their payment models on things, and there are two big changes coming through um, in skilled nursing facilities and in home health care, um, both of which we think might reduce physical therapy for folks um, and shorten length of stay. So as a reminder, uh, if, if, any, if anybody comes up against that, please let our office know. One of the things we do is every once in a while we do some big ticket litigation items, challenging observation status. I know a lot of folks have probably heard about that in hospitals. Um, but if there are some real adverse consequences in the nursing homes and at home health, please let us know. Can I just respond? Well, I can just tell you from my chiropractor is on the Connecticut chiropractic board and he they're definitely pushing for this in DC um, as a there's a you know in every state they work on their own things but at the DC level they're pushing for that one thing I will add about HR 3 and it doesn't speak directly to your um, to your chiropractic issue but there's a lot of traditional you know in traditional Medicare there's a lot of things that aren't covered right you know there, there's it's not a head to toe um, and so there's a, a 345 billion dollars um, is expected to be saved over 10 years in by by implementing HR3 at the federal level and and it's not that then that money just goes away it's to be reinvested and a lot of the the things that aren't covered now are up for negotiation for being covered then um, so that it does get to help people who who you know really can't um, tackle that but also we're talking about hearing vision dental you know the basics that are all required to maintain your health um, but traditional Medicare doesn't necessarily uh, do what others do if I could just uh, amplify what Nora just said HR 3 lower prescription drug costs is a big issue for our group as well and one very important feature of the bill is that it would allow Medicare to negotiate with the government for drug prices, just like the VA is allowed to do that now. That would be a, a tremendous help if that happened. Uh, good morning. Uh, Mark Warren, um, my wife and I have been residents of Simsbury for 30, almost 35 years. Uh, thank you for putting this uh, panel on. Uh, two things real quick. One is, uh, related to one of the items that was in the packets that we received on um, pension and Social Security income. And this is something that I have a feeling affects almost everybody directly in their pocketbooks who's here this morning. Um, earlier this year, I received a postcard from our state senator announcing this. And at first, it seemed pretty straightforward, but I had some questions. So. Cause, and I needed clarification on how this would affect my wife's and my f income. Um, the good news is that it does lower our income, state income taxes, but we didn't know exactly how much. So I called the Department of Revenue Services earlier this year, and the person seemed pretty friendly, but she had no idea how this worked. So I made some other calls. I even <laughs> did uh, research of the bill itself, and I couldn't figure this out. So my request is this, and this is to Susan. The, make sure that the Department of Service people who answer the phone know how this works. And secondly, let's make it user-friendly. Maybe this analyst, this chief analyst, can put examples. So depending upon your adjusted gross income or your filing status, and what happens over time in terms of the exemption, if there were some examples on the Department of Service website, it would be. You spoke to someone at the Department of yes. Revenue Services, oh, yeah. and they yeah. couldn't answer. Yeah, in all fairness, it was during tax season. They might have been overwhelmed because they were involved in. But right. she, she didn't even know that I even. I'm really in support of this because we hear so much, we get such a bad rap about our taxes in Connecticut. This is going to help almost everybody in this room. And it's important, especially with the SALT uh, issue that's going on, right? Um, and I'm going to make a suggestion 
uh, to Representative Hampton. Um, why don't we see if the Office of Legislative Research and Department of Revenue Services can do a one-pager and have a phone number um, that with, with a person's name who is the resident DRS expert so that people can call because um, I, I think it's your point is very well taken and we should have people answering the phone who can um, help with answers. Thank you. The other point relate, you know, we talk a lot about medication costs. I'm looking, I forgot your name. Nora. Nora, because you're with AARP. So right now we're, we're, we have the opportunity to enroll in either stay in our plan or for Medicare. Well, I'm on a medication that is fairly expensive. I think it's considered a tier three. And I go into the plan finder and I look up what the cost is gonna be based upon mail order, which you'd think is cheaper. Supposed to be. Or a preferred pharmacy. At first, I didn't even put in a standard pharmacy. Well, guess what? If you put in, in my case, if you put in a standard pharmacy as opposed to a preferred, it's significantly lower. Hmm. The problem is we don't have a user-friendly way of putting in the medication name and finding out of all those plans and where you can get the drug from, where you can actually save the most. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. And do you use the, the new, new tool this year? New, yes. new this year is on Medicare.com? Yes. <laughs> Great. Yes. So the new tool is not working we either. We need something <laughs> that makes it, Perfect. believe me, look at You know what? I think um, Access Health Connecticut is working on this. Julie, have they done the prescription drug piece or is that on the agenda? Health score CT. Yeah. Health score CT. And I know you can right now go to that um, and look at how much it costs for particular medical procedures, right? Like a hip replacement or a knee replacement. And you can compare amongst different hospitals and healthcare providers. Um, and they also do a scorecard for quality of care. But I don't know that they do. And so we are working on the prescription drug piece because that would be a way that you could go and compare where is the cheapest place to get a particular drug. And I'm actually quite shocked that the mail order turns out to be most expensive. I was too. And if I didn't keep persisting and just looking and looking and looking, I mean, it's a $1,500 a year difference. Wow. Yeah. And I'd be glad to show any of you so we, we've heard a lot of complaints about the new plan finder tool uh, it kind of got rushed out right before open enrollment um, but I would recommend uh, the choices counselors in each town and at the area ag agencies on aging can help you put a drug list together in that plan finder tool and you might be able to get a, a comprehensive look at it okay it would be a lot easier though if there was a tool online yeah. and I have AAR I'm sorry I have an AARP United Healthcare plan. So I, I will say this: we, uh, and as I'm getting ready, I think I have an interview about this later today. So that's good that you're telling me that new plan finder isn't working well. No, um, it works. You just have it's you just not have to spend way too much time. You have yeah. to keep yeah. digging. Yeah. Um, I, I would just second that there's never a time that I don't tell everyone, including my parents, where I grew up over the other side of the mountain in Bloomfield also, which my parents won't listen to me on this one, but is, um, that's fine, you know, uh, is your federal, your tax dollars are already paying for Choices Counselors. The North Central Area Agency on Aging runs the Choices Counselor program. There's people in every town. You already paid for it. There's no harm in going to sit down with someone who's trained and is in that ugly tool all the time. Um, I really encourage people every single year, just take a look, make sure what you're choosing fits you and any possible scenarios that may have changed since the year before, because it can mean a big difference in, in, in what you're paying, and it's really got to meet your needs. I, I want to thank all of you for listening. Did you have a question? This lady. I just have a question on something you mentioned before about Medicare. Did you say they, uh, they want to uh, cut physical therapy more? Because you know what? A lot of times physical therapy cuts the medical stuff where you have to keep going. 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so there are two new changes to the uh, payment models. In the skilled nursing facility uh, setting, right, you go to a hospital and then you go to a skilled nursing facility afterwards for rehabilitation, um, they are actually they're promoting more group therapy as opposed to individualized therapy, which we think may have some adverse consequences. Um, and there's also more of an incentive now financially to, uh, to maximize 15 days of, of, of a stay. Uh, so it's a much short, it could potentially be a shorter stay for folks in those rehab facilities. And so there's no, I, there have been no changes to the outpatient setting. Um, but if you're getting, say you're getting home health care and you're getting your therapy through home health care through Medicare, there may be some changes there um, as well. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Bunny Kleiman. I um, have been disabled since I was 22, lived in a wheelchair for 14 years, and chose to decide that we were going to fight the world, and um, started out in Bloomfield. We had the first handicap commission in Bloomfield, and I was um, chairman of that. We first thing we did was have every school ramped so that families could go in and see their kids, the teachers. You know, they always had the announcement that you're all welcome in our school. And I raised my hand in the middle of a, of a, a Board of Education annual meeting and I looked at Dr. Whetstone and I said, isn't that for the elite majority who can walk? Mm -hmm. And the next day, Harper Current, Harper Times, had three column articles on first headline on Harper Current, which I almost killed them, maimed mother unable to come to the classroom but it made a point um, and I don't mind making points like that and um, so we had that done so that every school was ramped for the first level and, and, the, and the curb cuts in the center of Bloomfield and that was done my daughter is 55 and I became disabled when she was 8 months old so we did a lot of things just on being able to speak and um, not swear at the same time, okay? I can also swear if I have to, but it's done very specifically and it makes the point when I do it. Um, we came to, um, and I was then the chairman of the um, State Handicap Commission. Um, and then I, I had a job, I had a husband, I had two kids that you know, had to be raised and taken care of and a lot of medical expenses that were incre incredible um, because we had a, the accident that put me in a wheelchair, um, cost $350,000 of medical bills that weren't covered by insurance. Um, every one of those, by the way, were paid off. Um, I think about, what, 25 years ago or something like that, but every doctor got paid, every hospital got paid, um, and one doctor um, retired and waived the rest of his bill. Oh, nice. And so now we're sitting here as seniors and also permanently disabled, and I drive a handicap retrofitted car. My husband has the same car retrofitted, and I go in for, I can't have any um, mail order pharmacy because I am allergic to corn products and every and deadly allergic to corn products mm -hmm. so every one of my drugs has to be checked and and Optum RX my husband uses it I think his bill totals at the end of the year of about three hundred dollars one one drug that I take was fifteen thousand dollars a year and then it reduced to 10,000, and now I think it's down a little lower. Um, EpiPens, they expire. They expire before I've ever used them because I've never had to use it, but you're not gonna take the chance. Once I used it, and that was on a, on a trip, and somebody got stung by a bee, and I used my EpiPen for them, but um, they didn't know they were allergic. But, you know, disability and aging, um, the, all of us have gone into this, this area, and it seems that the disabled um, are not being looked at the same way anymore. 
that the elderly are. And since I've been disabled since I was 22, and I'm 77 now, um, and still fighting the world, and retired from my business um, three years ago, finally. I kept retiring, they kept calling me back. I actually think that our commissioner, who has both a, both um, aging and services for people with disabilities under her bailiwick, might like to respond to that. Thank you. Yes, I, I think that's a great model here in Connecticut where we have, um, under this administration, we've brought aging and disability services together under the same department so that we can start to look at how can we leverage some of those resources that somebody might need regardless of their age. It's about functional limitations. It's about what's, what's getting in the way regardless of your age, regardless of your disability. So our department is geared toward that, and that's part of why I wanted to come today to hear what some of the issues are that are coming up so thank you for sharing that <laughs> great test mic check uh, my name is Walter Bansaf I've lived in Simsbury for 42 years and um, I I'm uh, grateful for this opportunity to address some people who may be able to fix a problem that affects way more than than my family um, it's an unnecessary failure by the state government. Um, 39,000 retired professionals are now affected. Uh, by law, they were not allowed as employees to contribute to Social Security. So I know some people are saying, yep, I know who that is, uh, but I'll, I'll not reveal it yet. <clears throat> so the state forced this group to be totally dependent on the state of Connecticut for retirement benefits. Um, the state is supposed to contribute by an act of the legislature one-third of their subsidized health insurance premiums. One-third from the Teachers Retirement Board. Oh, I let it slip out. One-third from the retiree and one-third from the state. The state has not done that. There's a $200 million deficit. And if you divide that by 39,000 teachers, that's about $5,000 per retired teacher. These are professionals. They served our communities well. I mean, who's up in heaven? Teachers, mostly kindergarten teachers. Uh, you know, they're, they're the good folks. They're wonderful folks. And I would just ask that you do whatever you can. I'll try to keep it shorter than what I wrote, but right now we have plan A and plan B. And one is lousy and the other is lousy and more expensive. Uh, so it's a very, very different situation from even last year. And thank you for your attention, and uh, I hope you can do something. And I would say she's the last question. Yes, ma'am. Microphone down here. Okay, I'll just, I promise her. Hi. So one thing I wanted to ask you about is, as you're looking at creating Simsbury to be a senior friendly location is to take an opportunity to look at it from the point of your seniors and those with disability and actually try sitting in a wheelchair and going through the town of Simsbury and see what obstacles you run up against. My father is 81 years old, perfectly capable, 100% mentally there. His only disability is that he's in a wheelchair. And yet he's reduced to a childlike role in many ways, which is contrary to Olmsted, contrary to what we're supposed to be doing, because he requires me to be with him and forces a dependence on him. I can take him and drive him to a doctor's appointment. He can be dropped by dial ride at a doctor's appointment. But if he can't open the door to get into the building to get to the elevator, to then get to the next door that can't be opened. Cult. Um, not everyone has the financial means to be able to take their home and make it ADA accessible. And yet, when I look at development in the town and the condos and the houses that are being built, I see congregate living for those that are elderly and those that are disabled. And the point of Olmstead isn't congregate living. It's not taking everybody the same and putting them in one area. It's about them living their life within the community 
fully. And if we don't look at requiring developers to build units that are handicapped accessible with bedrooms on the first floor, with fully equipped bathrooms and kitchens, we're not truly making our community accessible to all. We're still forcing our older population and our disabled population into pockets. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And sometimes I see towns doing things that are meant with good intentions, but with unintended consequences. Um, for example, with my father, they've, most towns have now moved to putting in, I call them rumble strips, uh, on the curbside. And um, when I called a couple of towns to ask, why did you put these in? I'm told, well, it was in one town. They, most towns don't seem to know why they do it other than they think it's a good idea. One said it was for the blind, although it struck me as odd because they're painted red. Um, but my father's 81 years old, and we have a running joke that he's not a martini. I don't want him shaken and stirred. If you take a wheelchair and you go over those rumble strips, you're all jostled. My father's 81 years old with a number of different health issues. He doesn't need to be jostled every time he goes up and down on a curb cut. And I think that in terms of development for towns, I think sometimes towns and cities and states are doing things without thinking it through. And I think if you put yourself in a wheelchair, put yourself in a walker, put yourself, walk with a cane and put some marbles in one of your shoes and truly see what it is like to navigate your community and see if you can get through, see if you can get into the restaurants, see what your access is to the library. I know the state requires a certain number of parking spaces, but look at your grocery stores. So do we truly mean only four people with a disability can grocery shop at any one time? Um, if my father can't park his handicapped vehicle in a handicapped spot, he has to go home. He can't do his grocery shopping or he has to park extremely far out in the hopes that no one parks next to him, blocking the ramp that needs to come out for him to be able to get in on his vehicle. We have been places where he has not been able to get back in his vehicle because he's been parked in. Even though there's signs on the side, please do not park next to within eight feet of this vehicle. And again, it puts him in a childlike role when he should not be in a childlike role. He really I think that be you would be a fabulous person to be on Mr. LaMontagne's commission. What do you think? Absolutely. There you go. Well, I'll get off my high horse on that. <laughs> Um, but I do have one other thing, which is medications. Um, my father is also very fortunate with his pension, with what he has to be able to afford his medications. But it is not uncommon for me to go to the pharmacy and spend $400, $800, $1,200 on his medications. And this is a man who goes through all those systems. He checks what is going to be the least expensive plan for him and cover the majority of his medications. But as someone who's I'm now starting to age. Um, I'm looking at it as with what I've been able to put away, am I going to be able to afford my medications the way that he has? And that's really frightening. Um, most people of my generation don't have pensions. We don't rely, necessarily believe that Social Security is going to be there. And if we don't address the issue of the cost of medications, it's a very scary prospect for me knowing what I have put aside and how much it's costing him for his medications. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we're going to do one more uh, question. And we have this very patient lady with the NYPD hat on. So um, you have the floor and make it a good one. <laughs> yes, I'm waiting for somebody to address the elephant in the room. I don't need You're a, need a microphone. microphone. That's the, uh, and brevity is the solo wit, by the way, so I'll make it quick. Yes. Yes. Yeah. OK. I'm Linda DiNapoli. I live in West Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a realtor. I want addressed right now the elephant in the room and that's the taxes which are forcing not just not just the seniors, but others out of, uh, out of the state. We have two sites online where people are talking about living in double wides in Tennessee for almost nothing. That's not my idea, heaven. I'm not going, I'm staying and I'm fighting, but you have got to stop taxing us to death. I wanna know what the government, governor has planned to stop this out migration. We had one of the top five real estate agencies in West Hartford shut down on Friday. That is not a good sign. And you have to help with the housing crisis on both ends. Thank you. So here is what we are doing. Uh, we made a budget that was, uh, that started with the premise that we were going to cut the 3.7
dollar budget deficit that was looming for uh, this year and next year. And we cut that deficit without raising uh, the sales tax and the income tax. And we said, we have to stop maxing out the state credit cards because the prior administration was putting $1.6 billion a year, each year for the past eight years, on our credit cards. So we said, we are cutting up some of the credit cards and we are only going to bond or put on the state credit card stuff that is um, critical to health and safety. And so uh, we have cut back um, by at least 40% um, on what we've been uh, spending on indebtedness because our unfunded liabilities are very high. And when we pass the deficit that uh, passed the budget that cut the almost $4 billion deficit, and we said we are stopping that bonding. Um, several of the Wall Street credit rating agencies upgraded Connecticut, so uh, Connecticut's financial rating. So it took us decades to get where we are. It's going to take us a little while to get out of the financial hole, but we have uh, made a good start. So unfortunately, we're going to be kicked out of the room, but we've been kicked out of better places. Um, but thank you so much, all of you, for um, for being here. This is um, this is not the end of the conversation. Of course, you can reach out to all of us, um, especially me as your state representative individually, or uh, my office hours, or phone, email, I'm happy to discuss any issue with you. And again, a uh, second round of applause for our amazing panelists. And thank you for being here. about to help me. Oh my gosh, you know what? So I think of you as having dark hair. It was longer and darker, so I love the blonde, but so nice to see you. I'm, oh, I'm totally with you. Mine's peeking out. Thank you.